this evening to uh, chat about all the questions you've got around growth mindset. So uh, settle yourselves in. And as you settle yourselves in, please drop a note in the chat box. Let me know who you are, where you're coming from. And I know some of you have sent through uh, questions already for, uh, for me to answer during the session. Uh, but if you've got particular questions you want to make sure I cover, drop them in the chat box now. I will be glancing over at the chat box throughout the session to uh, make sure I address everybody's questions on the way through. So welcome here this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever you are in the world. And uh, I'm looking forward to starting very, very soon. So I can see, oh, South Africa, Rika, welcome. Um, very early in the morning there for you. I'm doing a South African presentation tomorrow evening with uh, Thinking School South Africa, which I'm looking forward to as well. Um, uh, yeah, that's fine. If you've got reasons for your cameras being off, you've got bad internet connections, you're driving a car, all that sort of stuff, that's all good, no problems at all. I'm looking over here at people's faces. Singapore, g'day, Anne, how are you? Good to see you here. Anne, are you part of any of the schools that I've been working with in Singapore recently? I've been working with heaps of schools in Singapore since uh, October or so last year. Jenny from New Zealand, Northern California. What time is it in Northern California? Good to see you here, Elizabeth. Romania, oh, Claudia, Claudia, hey, how are you? Claudia is from Romania, does some great work over there. It's great to see, you must be up at all sorts of hours of the morning. I've got no idea what time it is in Romania at the moment, but uh, welcome. I'll come over here so I can actually see your smiling faces a bit better as well. 8.30 p.m., Lauren from Lockdown. Oh, hey, Lauren, I'm with you. I'm here in Seaford. For those of you who don't know, uh, Melbourne, which is where I'm coming from, Victoria and Australia, um, we've had, by world standards, a great time of COVID. We had a lockdown for a while last year, but we've been almost back to normal until just very, very recently where we've gone into a snap five-day lockdown to try and uh, stamp out what looks like the UK version of the virus coming through. So, uh, Claudia, 6.30 a.m., well done for getting up. Buffalo, New York, United States. Scott from Kansas. Great to see so many US people involved. It's good to see you coming along. Um, as I'm scanning down, when you see me looking this way, I'm scanning the chat. As you see me looking down, you have particular questions, um, drop them in the chat box. Let me know yeah, you know, why you're here. What do you want to find out? Because as much as I have a very clear plan about what I want to do, if it's not what you need, I'm going to change all of that. So um, make sure that you uh, let me know what your needs are in this session. We'll get started. Um, for those of you who haven't met me, don't press that button, press this one. Uh, my name's James Anderson. Uh, I've been working with habits of mind, growth mindsets, uh, virtuous practice for, for 20 odd years now. And uh, along the way, we've learned some of the subtleties around this work. And it's really around those subtleties that make all the difference in our implementation that I wanted to talk to you about today. Because what we'll discover as we go through is that there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of social media. There's a lot of um, you know, posters and you know, do this for growth mindset and most of them don't work. So I'm gonna to talk to you about what does work, answer some of your questions about how we implement this in the classroom. And there is gonna be an invitation to do more of this work with me as well. One of my flagship online courses is my uh, Growth Mindset Masterclass. So one of the, we can't answer everything today, obviously. There will be an invitation at the end of this to join me on my Growth Mindset Masterclass, either as a self-paced option, if that doesn't suit your time zone, or as a uh, coached option with me doing live webinars. So let's make a start. Um, probably easiest to start with my personal backstory around growth mindset. I was a uh, middle years curriculum leader at a P12 school here in Melbourne. And uh, it was this time of the year, late January, February, uh, we had about 40 degrees Celsius that day. 
so it's stinking hot. It was my first year in a significant leadership role. I was that middle years curriculum leader. And my middle school principal pulled me aside to have that, you know, start, that talk at the start of the year. And the first question she asked me, first day on the job, was this one. She said, James, what are you going to do this year to help make your students more intelligent? I went, what? She said, James, what are you going to do this year to help make your students more intelligent? And I thought about it for a while and I thought, God, this job could be harder than I thought. But then it dawned on me. She was asking me a differentiation question, wasn't she? She was asking me, how was I going to cater for those really bright, really able, really smart kids with extension programs and you know, those sorts of challenging tasks? And how is I going to cater for those less able kids with alternative programs and alternative assessment and aids and support and that sort of stuff? And she looked at me and she said, no, James, I want to know what you're going to do, not just as a classroom teacher, but as a leader in this school to ensure that all students become more intelligent by the end of the year. I didn't have a clue. Just as I look across at your faces, give me a wave if you reckon you've got a confident answer to that question. Very, very few people. And that was what started me on this journey with growth mindsets because what the Joanne Roberts, my principal, was asking me was a mindset question. How did I view students' intelligence and abilities? Let me ask you a few questions that perhaps resonate with you. Um, here in Australia, we're in about week three or week four of term one. So if you're not in that same sort of space, just imagine you were. You've known the kids now. You've got to know their names. You've seen them in class. You've seen how they work. Being an experienced teacher, how many of you could pretty confidently sit down today in week three or four of term one and write those students' end of year reports? Now, don't get me wrong. I used to pride myself on this. Having been in the school for a while, I would look at my class list that I'd get at the end of the previous year and I'd look down and I'd go, fantastic, I've got this kid, <sighs> barely got to be in the room and that kid's going to do well. And geez, who gave me that one? And right then and there, I was already making judgments about the type of student that I had, who would succeed and who would struggle. Let me ask you a similar question. Do you ever talk about potential, formally or informally, in your classrooms, kids' potential? Did you talk about that? Yeah, we used to talk about it all the time. No, not in reports, but certainly in the staff room. Just imagine that, though. Is this the way you talk about it? Do you look at one student and go, wow, that's so much it's extraordinary what you're capable of, but not so much for you? Is that the way we think about potential? Just imagine if you met these two students in the street when they're 30. And by any definition you want to use, they're doing exactly the same thing. Are you looking at this one going, wow, congratulations, that's great for you. Who would have thought? Well, great, well done. What went wrong? Same thing. You're wrapped for one student, disappointed for another. And if that sort of idea resonates with you, and it resonates with about 99% of the people I work with. Do you reckon you've got some teachers in your school that could write the reports for the end of the year right now? Then it could be that we're carrying with us a relatively fixed view of intelligence and abilities. And that, of course, is what Carol Dweck talks about when she talks about mindset. It's how we view ours and other people's abilities. And basically, she describes these two types of mindset. Someone with a fixed mindset sees the world like this. Hey, look at me. What you see, <laughs> this is pretty much what you get. The person standing here today, pretty much the same person that will be standing here in five years' time because this is just the way I am. And when you see yourself like that, this is me, get used to it, you spend your life looking inwards. You ask yourself, who am I? What abilities do I have? And as a result of discovering the answer to that question, you have to work out where you fit in the world, what you're suited to. 
On the other hand, someone with a growth mindset sees the world very differently. Someone with a growth mindset sees the world like this. Hey, look at me. What you see is just who I happen to be at the moment. I change, not a little bit, I change a lot. I change some of my most basic characteristics, my talents, my abilities, my intelligence. It's all up for grabs. The person standing here today, a shadow of the person that will be standing here in five years' time because I get on with the business of changing myself. And when you see yourself like that, you don't spend your life looking inwards, asking who am I and what am I suited to? You spend your life looking outwards, asking who do I want to become and what do I need to do to become that person? And in that difference, the inward looking, who am I, what abilities do I have? And the outward looking, what abilities do I need and what do I need to do to become that person? Lies the key difference between the fixed and the growth mindset. And that is the idea of choice. It's not that people with a fixed mindset make bad choices. They just don't see the choice in the first place that I have to ask myself, do I have musical abilities? And if I don't, well, I can't be musical. Now, one of the big misunderstandings about mindset is what I'm about to talk about. And it's going to change the way you look at mindset. If you had a choice, and let's be really clear about this, you don't have this choice, what would you rather see in your kids in your classroom? Kids with a fixed mindset or kids with a growth mindset? I'm guessing growth, yeah? The thing is that most of the strategies we're using in schools and classrooms at the moment teach students to sound like they have a growth mindset. Whereas the idea in your head is the mindset. Uh, the list of behaviours I'm about to go through are the logical outpourings of holding these ideas in your head. They're not the mindset. The mindset's the idea in your head. The behaviours are just the actions that make sense. So, for example, someone with a fixed mindset will avoid challenges. And why wouldn't you? For someone with a fixed mindset, a challenge is just an opportunity to fail. Sure, you might be able to do that, but if you do it and fail, then everyone will know where your limits are. So much, be much better to say, yes, I could do that, but I won't. Do you have any students that say things like that? Yeah, yeah, I could do that, but I'm just not going to, I don't want to. These kids will give up easily. And again, why wouldn't you? For these kids, things that are hard today are going to be hard tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. Have you ever struggled with something? As I look across at the faces, just give me a wave if you've struggled with anything at any time in your life. Yeah, a few of us have, good to know. One person didn't wave. I'm going to talk to you later on because that seems unlikely. How would you like to feel like that all day, every day? See, for someone with a fixed mindset, when they get, find something difficult, they go, no, no, that's not for me. It would be easy if I had the ability. So their life becomes about the path of least resistance. If that's hard, if it makes me struggle, it's not for me. I'll find the thing that I can do easily. These kids see effort as a bad thing, a bad thing. How many of you have jumped on the praise effort bandwagon? Praise kids for effort, encourage effort, praise effort, all that sort of stuff? Yeah, yeah. Why would you praise kids for something they think is bad? See, when you say to a student, great effort, good to see you working so hard today, they hear you must be stupid or you wouldn't have to work that hard. Oops. It doesn't matter what your intention is. It doesn't matter that you don't mean that to say that. For someone with a fixed mindset, that's what they hear because effort's what's required to make up for a deficit. But what do we do? Too often we see students putting in this sort of effort. I call that the constipation version of effort. 
And what we see is that someone comes up to them and says, oh, good to see you working hard, so hard. Keep up the hard work. It's a shame you're not learning anything. But as long as you're trying your hardest, that's okay. Can I suggest to you that's one of the most damaging things we can say to a child? As long as you're trying your hardest, that's okay. What's the message there? You've just put everything into that piece of work. It's not real great. So you better get used to not being able to do great work. In the masterclass, I spent a lot of time talking about effort. But I'll say it now that this is not an effort mindset. It is a growth mindset. And if the sort of effort you're putting in is not leading to growth, it's not because you're not capable of the growth. It's because you're putting in the wrong sort of effort. These students will ignore your feedback, not because they're being unpleasant or uncooperative. They just don't see it as helpful. If they could do it, they would have done it. So all your feedback they receive as criticism of things they can't do. And they're threatened by the success of other people. Everything other people can do just highlight something they can't. So they'll cut those other people down. They'll say they're just lucky or they've had some special advantage that someone's denied them. You see, for these kids, being comes before doing. They're going to look inside themselves and discover if they've got the abilities before they'll give it a go. And you hear this. I'm sure you've heard this. Have you ever had a student come up to you and say, Miss, do you think I'll be any good at this? Who's heard that sort of question? See, these kids are asking you to look inside them, tell them they've already got the abilities and therefore take away any risk of failure. And these kids think that learning is about discovering. School is one long test to work out what they can and can't do. And as a result, all these behaviours, if I can't do it once, I won't do it again, this is exactly the sort of thing that makes sense from their worldview. Just out of curiosity, those, be, those symptoms, you know, giving up easily, um, not valuing feedback, you know, not putting in effort and those sorts of things, who sees some of those symptoms in their children, in their students? Yeah, absolutely. I see this all the time in the schools that I work with. We've got students that give up easily, that won't listen to our feedback, that don't value other people's success. And what we need to do is to shift their mindset. Because when you see the world from a growth mindset perspective, your behaviours are very, very different. These students love a challenge. Don't waste my time with easy stuff. Give me hard stuff, thing that's going to stretch me, challenge me, help me grow. These students are more persistent because they understand that things that are hard today will be easy tomorrow. See, someone with a fixed mindset says, if this step is hard, this step is going to be really hard, this step really, really hard, that step would be impossible. Someone with a growth mindset says, this is hard until it's easy. This is hard until it's easy. It doesn't get harder and harder and harder. It's just always the next step that is hard. These kids see effort as a good thing. Praise these kids for their effort all day, every day. In fact, if you try to praise them for their product, for the thing they've just produced, they're likely to turn around and go, yeah, yeah, I know. But did you see what I had to do to get there? Because they understand that the standard is temporary. They understand that their best is only their best when you measure by yesterday's standards. By tomorrow's standards, it's going to be their second best. So these kids aren't interested in where they're at. They're interested in what they did to get there. These students value your feedback. They don't expect to be able to do something to discover their abilities. They expect to go through a process and they need your support in doing that. And they love other people's success. Everything somebody else can do 
just highlights what's possible. They see that and realize they used to be like me and they did, did, did to become that person and that person did, did, did to become that. I don't want to do what they do. I want to do this other thing that no one's ever done before. But if they can start here and do that, what's stopping me from starting here and doing that? See, these students understand that becoming comes before the being. They don't look inside themselves and ask, do I have the ability? Am I musical? They look at the musicians and say, that's really cool. Can I learn how to do that, please? They don't ask themselves, am I a leader? They say that leadership stuff. I think I want to do some of that. How's that done? And they work on becoming the person that can do that. And they get the learning process. They understand that learning is about creating new abilities. And in no small way is one of the big differences between the fixed mindset and the growth mindset, the understanding of yourself as a learner. That what we're trying to do here is to help students understand their capacity to change. Because people with a growth mindset understand what George Bernard Shaw told us all those years ago that life isn't about finding yourself. But how often do we hear that sort of message? I'm trying to work out who I am. I'm trying to work out what I'm good at. I'm trying to work out what I'm suited to. But rather life is about creating yourself. And I should mention that someone with a fixed mindset loves a personality test. Like how many of you have ever been the victim of a personality test before? Yeah, you've done the survey and it said, oh, look, you're blue LMPT. Ah, oh, blue LMPTs, they're really suited for this. They're cut out for these sort of roles. They're really good at these things. And you're told what you are. And in that process, you're also given an excuse for what you're not. Ah, oh, blue LMPTs, yeah, they're not suited to those sort of things. That's why you find that sort of thing hard. You'll never be good at these things. What the, someone with a fixed mindset has had happened to them is they've built boundaries around themselves or had other people build boundaries around them for them. Mum and dad have said, I was never very good at maths either. No wonder you can't do it. Oh, so I'm not mathematical. <laughs> no need to try there, hey? And we get these messages that build these boundaries. Now, as I said before, <sighs> A lot of the strategies that have been attempted in uh, schools around the world have basically said, this is fixed, this is growth, can you do this, please? And it's not that easy. Changing mindsets isn't about changing your words. Changing mindsets is about changing beliefs. And not just any old belief. These are some of the most deeply held beliefs that you hold center to who you are. And those sort of beliefs aren't easily changed. And Carol Dweck recognized this recently, where she said, look, we get it. We understand mindsets. We've got a huge body of research that says how important growth mindsets are. And I'm going to give you some access to that research in a little while. The problem has been that they didn't, we didn't recognize the complexity of implementation. The complexity of implementation. The number of schools, and look, it's well-intentioned, I'm not being critical, but we took what sounds like an easy idea. You know, people with a fixed mindset do this, people with a growth mindset do that, let's just do those things. And we ran to Pinterest. <laughs> For our implementation strategies and what we did is we put posters on the wall we put posters on the wall like this now who, who's seen this sort of post who's got this display up in their classroom absolutely but there's nothing wrong with this it's just not complete it is true to say that um, people with a growth mindset or people with a fixed mindset say i'm not good at this and people with a growth mindset say what am i missing the problem is with the heading it's not change your words and change your mindset. All that does is make it sound like you've got a growth mindset. The heading should be the other way around. 
It should be change your mindset and watch your words change. See, the problem becomes this. Yeah, you put these posters up and you say to the kids, instead of saying this, try saying that. But then something else happens. So instead of saying, I'm not good at this, ask, what am I missing? But then, well, I don't know what I'm missing. Like, you know, I give up. I'll use a different strategy. Well, if I had a different strategy, I wouldn't have given up. Can you see how this It just doesn't work the way we hoped it would? Um, this is too hard. It may take some time. I spent the time and I still don't know how to do it. I made a mistake. Oh, God, mistakes. Mistake, mistakes helped me learn. Well, not that one. All right, so we could go through this and we can have a look at this. This is in the book I'm about to give you. That um, Jane, my wonderful assistant, who I didn't introduce earlier on, Jane's on the call with me. Uh, Jane's going to drop a copy of this ebook into the uh, chat box for you to download. And this goes through some of the research, some of the um, common problems with implementation strategies as they are. And while, you, while she does that and you're all busy clicking and downloading, I'm just going to scan back through the chat, which I can't monitor while I'm talking, and just see if, what questions have come up to make sure I'm going to cover them or that I will change what I do as I cover them. Gender differences. Yeah, I'll talk about gender differences. If I don't get to gender differences, just prompt me again at the end, but yes. Uh, grading, Scott, is a huge thing. I will talk about that. I talk about it in the book as well, but absolutely assessment is an issue. What we need to do with assessment is actually change its meaning, but we'll get to how we do that. Now, Carol Dweck's book. Something really interesting about this. I um, was rereading the first chapter of this a little while ago. And two things struck me. The first one is probably the biggest misunderstanding about mindsets that pervades our community, not just education. And I can't make this point clearly enough. That Carol Dweck, in the first chapter of her book, lists a dozen people that you'd know that have growth mindsets and a dozen people that you'd know that have fixed mindsets. And one of the things they have in common is that they are all highly successful. You see, you don't need a growth mindset to grow. I'll just say that again. You don't need a growth mindset to grow. There are plenty of people with fixed mindsets who achieve enormous growth. It helps to have a growth mindset, but it's not necessary. All a growth mindset is, and I said this before, is an idea in your head. It's not the growth. I'll say that again. A growth mindset's not growth. All a growth mindset is is an invitation to grow. All it tells you is, I can grow. It doesn't tell you how to achieve that growth. And that misunderstanding is one of the biggest misunderstandings out there. That we think if we go in and teach the kids about the language and how important a growth mindset is, they'll suddenly improve their grades. And it doesn't always happen like that. I mean, we get this stuff, you know, the power of yet, you know, Carol Dweck's famous TED Talk. And uh, I invite you to go back and listen to that TED Talk carefully because while she does sort of say, you know, I don't know the answer yet and you know, I'm not good at this yet, just all this, how important is the word yet? And apparently all we need to do is to tell the students, don't say you can't, say you can't yet. <laughs> the problem with that is that when you say to a student, you know, don't say you can't, say you can't yet, you're making a promise to them. And the promise is that you will achieve at some point in the future. But when that not yet becomes still don't know the answer. I'm still not good at this. I still don't understand. I still can't do this. I still don't uh, know what the answer is. Then two things have happened. One, the student hasn't learnt. 
And two, they've lost trust in you. You see, when Carol Dweck talks about the power of yet, the power is not in the word yet. The power is that it gives you a pathway into the future where someone with a fixed mindset sees a boundary. I'm just not like that. I can't. The mindset gives you a pathway that says, oh, I can become that person. But it doesn't tell you how to achieve the growth. And that's why in the work I do in the Growth Mindset Masterclass and with the other work that I do, I talk not just about mindset, but about this idea of learning agility. And the agile learner is someone who not only understands they're capable of growth, this growth mindset part, but also understands how to achieve that growth. Because ultimately, that's what we're after. Not just kids who understand they can grow, We want to see them achieve the growth. And the thing I love about these three ideas is that they're not good ideas. That none of these authors made the things up. Carol Dweck, in her book, there you go, that one, didn't make up mindset. She observed it in people. She noticed when she was giving children hard tasks, some children, excuse me, Some children said, I love something hard. And other kids said, can I have something easy, please? And she said, that's really interesting. What happens when you think like that? Art Kostra and Benekalik's work up here around habits of mind, what they did through other people's research is went to the people who were the best in their field and said, what do you do? How do you get so good? And documented their patterns of behaviour, their habits of mind. And this work here, Anders Ericsson's work, you might have heard of Anders Ericsson through the 10,000 hour rule and those sorts of ideas. Um, What Ericsson did is he went to, again, high achievers and said, have you always been good at this? They said, no, used to be five-year-old and useless. And he said, that's really interesting. What did you do? What was the process? And it's not until you combine the understanding you're capable of growth with the behaviours you need to achieve the growth and apply them in the process through which you achieve growth, that you actually develop someone who not only understands they can, but knows how to. And that, of course, is the topic of my book, The Agile Learner. And as we go through the Growth Mindset Masterclass, we talk about how we develop this understanding, but also how we achieve this growth. Because at the end of the day, a growth mindset only works when you do the work. And for that matter, only when you do the right sort of work. The slogans, the catchphrases, there's nothing wrong with them, but they tend to be half-truths. Things like this, you know, you believe and you achieve. Well, that's lovely, but it's incomplete. What it should be is believe and you'll act. When you act effectively, you can achieve. So in the Growth Mindset Masterclass, we talk about what sort of actions that you need to achieve, what habits of mind allow you to grow, what process, the types of practice you engage in allow you to achieve that growth. Now, I'm just scanning again. Um, It's a challenge of beliefs. I've told that about thinking of the book. Um, Yep, good, 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 good. All right, so I think I'm keeping up with the questions. I still know the other ones that I've got to get to. So that's great, gender differences and so forth. As we go through, yeah, how do we um, help fixed mindset learner into a growth mindset one as they simply do not enjoy learning? (laughs) I wouldn't enjoy something I'm not good at either. I'll come back to that idea in a minute. One of the strategies here is to actually teach them how to achieve the growth. And um, uh, Daniel Pink, in his book, Drive, talks about how one of the truly motivating things that we experience as human beings is the experience of growth. Once you start achieving, once you're shown how to achieve, that in and of itself is motivating. I'll come back to that idea later, maybe. So we've got these two mindsets, fixed mindset, growth mindset. Now, 
something you might have had an inkling about. We talk a lot about students' mindsets, but have you recognised perhaps that you've got a mindset as well? That teachers in your school have particular mindsets? Let me talk for a moment about teachers that have, whoops, that have a fixed mindset. Teachers with a fixed mindset will walk into their classroom. They'll quickly judge which students have the abilities and which haven't. This student over here, I'm thrilled to have you in my class. I'll spend a lot of time with you, but you're just not cut out for my subject, so I won't waste too much time with you. When I walk into the staff room, there's a teacher in there that's really good. And the first thing I do is I slag them off. Is that an Australian term, to slag them off? To uh, put them down, to say they're not really that good. They, they give them the easy class. All the hard classes go to the good teachers like me. And when I'm talking to a first year teacher, I'll be talking to that first year teacher and I'll be saying things like, so you chose teaching as a profession. Mm -hmm. Are you sure that was a wise choice? Because it takes a special kind of person to be a good teacher. Not everyone is cut out for it like me. And if you don't, if you're not cut out for it, don't hang around because some people, they're just not suited to it and the job just chews them up and spits them out. So if you're not good at it and you'll know in the first six months, go find something else. On the other hand, a growth mindset teacher sees the world very differently. They'll walk into their classroom and look at the various standards the students are at, not abilities, the various standards they're at. And they'll say, great, we're all at different places. No idea where you're all going to end up in the future because it's up to what you do here. So the people who work the hardest and most effectively are the ones that are going to get the best grades at the end of the year. When I walk into the staff room and I see that talented teacher, my first response is to go, hi, how are you doing? I've seen what's going on in your classroom. It's amazing. Would you mind coming into my classroom for a while? Because I've seen what you do. When I try it, my classroom just falls to pieces. Can you come in and watch my classroom fall to pieces and tell me what I'm doing wrong so I can get better, please? I don't feel less because there's a talented teacher in the room. I feel blessed because I have the opportunity to grow. And when I see that um, beginning teacher, I say this to them, welcome to the profession. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. This is hard work and the first year is one of the hardest years you're going to have. You're going to make mistakes, probably lots of them. I can't tell you what you're going to do wrong, but come and sit down with me. Let's have a coffee. And I'll tell you about a few of the things that I did wrong in my first year because, man, I stuffed that up really badly. And at least you won't have to make those mistakes. I don't feel judged or less because I made mistakes. Again, I feel blessed because I have the opportunity to help a colleague grow. Now, very different, obviously, fixed and growth mindset. Just a quick show of hands um, for the people there on the, that I can see in the screen. And if you can't wave at me, type it in the chat box. How many of you have got a fixed mindset? Now, seriously, how many? Oh, you bloody liars. Can you see what we've done, though? We've given you a choice of two. We've said, this one's bloody awful. <laughs> Which one have you got? And pretty much everyone has gone, well, I've got a growth mindset. And as soon as we do that, no further work is necessary. And we've created what Carol Dweck and Susan Mackey have described as a false mindset. And it's this false mindset that is the biggest challenge in implementing growth mindsets in schools. Because a false mindset is someone who intellectually understands fixed and growth, may advocate growth mindset, will adopt growth mindset strategies. But because they haven't spent their time deeply reflecting on their own mindset, what they actually do in the classroom can send much more fixed messages. See, I worry, for example, and I worry about this a lot, how many teachers have adopted praise effort, but in practice, what actually happens in their classroom is it turns into praise struggling students for effort. And what's actually going on in their classroom and they're going, keep up the hard work. You're working really hard today. Good to see you working so hard. Oh, well done again. You've done that really easily. Congratulations. And if that's what's actually happening in the classroom, you're sending very 
fixed messages. You see, the trouble here, and again, I can't make this clear enough, is that you do not get to choose your mindset. You don't get to choose your mindset. Your mindset is part of what we call your unconscious bias. It's what happens when you're not paying attention. It's the fact that this week, all the difficult questions in the classroom have been directed to this student and this student and a couple of consolation questions to that student. It's the fact that when I talk to this student, I'm talking to them in a confident voice and I tell them that, yes, you can do this if you do this. And I give them constructive feedback. Hello. Uh, someone's got their speaker on. Thanks. Talk to this person in a confident voice and give them some constructive feedback. But when I talk to this student, oh, look, just hand in what you've done, sweetheart. That'll be fine. No, I'm exaggerating, but you reckon that might be happening in some of your classrooms? Do you think you might have some teachers that, well-intended teachers, please don't get me wrong, these people are doing the best they know how to do, but because they haven't spent the time reflecting deeply on their own mindset, might be actually developing more fixed mindsets in their students. You see, one of the things that we need to understand here is that the number one thing you can do to help change students' mindsets, not put a poster on the wall, not give a lesson about brain plasticity. The number one thing you can do is to spend some time reflecting on your own mindset. And so one of the big things I do in the masterclass is to not talk about the classroom strategies, although we do talk about that, but the number one strategy we can do is to challenge our own mindset. And so I spend a lot of time getting teachers to feel uncomfortable about the way we view students. And we've already picked up some of the ideas about you know, how assessment might actually be sending some of those fixed messages. And one of the strategies we do to, or use to help that is to actually ban the fix and the growth mindset in classrooms. All right, so here's your, your next tip. We're banning the fixed mindset and the growth mindset in classrooms. Don't use those terms anymore. They don't exist. You've all seen diagrams like this. This is Nigel Holmes's diagram. It's great. Helps you understand what fixed and growth mindset is, but it doesn't exist. In the real world, we fall somewhere along this continuum. And so Jane is going to put in the chat box now, um, a copy of this continuum, which is also on the back of the ebook you've just uh, downloaded as well. And when we recognize that our mindset isn't fixed or growth, it's somewhere in the middle, it helps us address this false mindset. Because for those of you who sort of went, eh, yeah, maybe I've got a fixed mindset, how many of you are prepared to say you could be more growth oriented and say that really confidently? See, particularly for that person that might be towards the fixed end of the continuum, admitting that you've got a fixed mindset, really hard thing to do. But to say, no, 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 I'm not fixed, but I might be able to improve is a much easier thing to address. In the um, Growth Mindset Masterclass, we talk about the strategies. We explore the ideas. We develop the techniques you need in your classroom to move students along that continuum. And I'd invite you after this session today, spend some time really getting to know that continuum. Find yourself somewhere in the middle. Find your typical students somewhere in the middle and ask yourself, how would your learning environment improve if you could move students just one notch to the right? Not all the way, that's not realistic one notch. And what we realise is that the mindset continuum helps us address that false mindset by saying it's not fixed, not growth. We can become more growth oriented. It helps us recognise that this reflects the real world. We don't have fixed mindset kids in our classrooms and we don't have growth mindset kids in our classroom. I had a very, very talented uh, principal, a prize winning principal, about five or six years ago now, with the best of intentions, 
trying to adopt growth mindset strategies. But because we still had that understanding of fixed or growth, what he did was he took all the kids that he thought had fixed mindset and put them in one classroom together because he thought that was the best way to deal with them. He was a great principal, a great leader. He's won awards for being a great leader. We just didn't understand back then what was required to change these mindsets. Um, importantly, it recognises that this is a journey, and Carol Dweck's been making this point for a long time now, that a growth mindset is not a declaration. You can't just decide to have one. You can't try to instill or install or adopt a growth mindset. Rather, we recognise this is a journey, and it's a journey of becoming increasingly growth-oriented. And it helps us reset our expectations for change. One of the reasons or one of the problems, I suppose, that has beset schools is that they went to a conference where someone spent 20 minutes on mindset, said, this is fixed, this is growth, ask kids to do this, go home, put the posters up, kids will be good by the end of the year. It didn't work. We expected the result of our effort to produce students with a growth mindset. And I'm sorry, you're just not going to get students with a growth mindset anytime soon. So what we need to understand is that, oh, look, this one's a little bit transparent. Hello there, I didn't realise I was transparent behind here. Um, your success with growth mindsets isn't going to be measured by the number of students with a growth mindset. It'll be measured by how much more growth oriented they have become. And so... Where you find yourself on that continuum is the sum total of what I call the fixed and growth mindset movers you experience in your life. So one of the questions came up before, is there a gender difference? There is a little bit of a gender difference. There is some research around that that says girls are slightly more likely to be towards the fixed end of the continuum than boys. And one of the reasons for that or the assumed reasons for that, is that girls often get praised for being things, and I'm making huge generalisations here, but girls are praised for being pretty, for being you know, well-mannered, for being, 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 where boys are more likely to be praised for doing things, for trying things. So obviously, it's not exclusive, but when there's a, you know, where you find yourself on that continuum, is the sum total of all those negative mindset movers and all those positive mindset movers. And girls might experience more of those negative mindset movers. So how do we do this? Let me share this with you. First off, you've got to recognise you're already doing this. You are filling your school environments with positive and negative mindset movers, with fixed and growth mindset movers. For example, which are you more likely to hear in your school? Are you more likely to hear, let me just pop in here so I can talk to you. Let's go up here. Are you more likely to hear conversations about your high achieving students or your students who are achieving highly? I'll say that again, your high achieving students or your students who are achieving highly. And if you can't hear the difference, talk to someone in the disability sector because we don't have any disabled students anymore, do we? They're not a category of students. We have students with a disability. Can you see how the first defines who you are? And that would act as a negative mindset mover. So in our environment now, the way we use assessment, the way we do lots of things creates negative mindset movers, but we also create some positive ones. You can adopt the catchphrases, you know, the the uh, not yet and believe in you can achieve type things, but ultimately they don't have a lot of effect. You can adopt the rules, the praise effort, the celebrate mistakes, but again, all what I call below the line strategies that don't have a huge amount of impact. The strategies that we adopt in the Growth Mindset Masterclass, the strategies that you'll learn and explore and apply in the Masterclass, have an impact on changing students' mindsets. The first one is we create what's called a style guide, a set of nudges, 
a set of little reminders to help teachers create more growth mindset movers in the classroom. So for example, just two of them that we explore early on. One, when we group students, like we did down here with the um, high achieving students, we group by verbs instead of adjectives. So we don't talk about our music students, which sounds like a type of student. We talk about our students studying music. We don't talk about our high achieving students. We talk about our students who are achieving highly. And that idea, these little nudges, because we, like I said, we can't declare a growth mindset. We've got to nurture, nourish, and nudge students along that continuum. The Style Guide brings together about 30 of these little reminders that help well-intentioned teachers overcome their unconscious bias and fill their environments with more growth mindset movers. And ultimately, by challenging teachers' mindsets, by helping them understand the influences that have left them with their mindset and explaining the things that they've assumed that might be wrong and left them with the fixed mindset. We challenge teachers to operate differently because when you see the world through a growth mindset lens, you don't need those nudges. It'll all just happen. And importantly, when you get the whole school together, and again, I work with whole schools on a regular basis around this, the sorts of issues that were brought up before around assessment, we look at those whole school structures and practices that help create the school environment, fill the school environment with more growth oriented messages. We change the meaning of assessment from being about who you are to being about where you are. And we've got a whole lot of assessment strategies that look at growth and development and so forth rather than status that help us do that. I'm just going to just quickly scan over to see if I've missed any other questions. All right, so Anshi, uh, um, certainly Anshi, we're working with uh, in Singapore, so we'll have a longer conversation. Anshi Wah's school is one of the schools that I'm working with around the uh, mindset continuum and developing the, um, the growth mindset style guide. And so we'll get together and have a longer conversation about how to do this. But certainly something we do. Um, and for anyone else who has to leave, it's all going to be recorded. We can follow you up later. Mindsets are just beliefs. They are powerful beliefs, but there's something in your mind and you can change your mind. I wish Carol Dweck hadn't said that. I really wish she hadn't said that because it made it sound like changing your mind was easy. You can change your mind about what you're having for dinner. That's pretty easy. You can change your mind about you know, where you're going to go on holiday. That's pretty easy. But changing your mind about whether you're musical, whether you're mathematical, whether it's capable for you to achieve this sort of thing, whether you can overcome the belief that you've been told your whole life that you're just not very smart, they're not things that you can just change. And so changing beliefs is hard. And in fact, changing beliefs or beliefs full stop don't work. See, all beliefs can do, come back a step. If I thought changing beliefs, if I thought changing beliefs was easy, I would work on better beliefs, like if they actually worked. For example, my belief in my ability to fly, like that'd be a pretty good thing to believe in, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be great? I could sit here and I could visualize myself flying. I could do it all day. I could feel the wind beneath my wings. I could come to a point where I deeply, truly believed that I could fly. I could walk out onto the roof here and throw myself off. And how do you reckon that's going to turn out? You see, beliefs don't work. All beliefs can do is lead you to make choices about your actions. But they've got to be the right sort of actions because the actions you take have consequences 
that you experience. And those consequences have nothing to do with your belief. Those consequences are governed by reality. When I throw myself off the roof, it doesn't matter that I believe I can fly. Reality is going to have me hurtling towards the ground and stopping suddenly at the bottom. And when I have that experience of falling through the air and hitting the ground, that experience comes back to feed into my beliefs. And for how much longer do I believe I can fly? And see, this has been the fundamental problem, one of about three fundamental problems, why our growth mindset strategies haven't worked. We're focused here. Don't say you can't, say you can't yet. Trust me, everyone's capable of growth. All those sort of just belief, belief, belief things, which we need to do. But then when students got the actions wrong, They engaged in the wrong sort of behaviours. They practised the easy things, not the hard things. They put in this sort of effort rather than what I call effective effort. Then what they experienced was no growth. And as a result, they went, no, teacher's lying. I really can't do this. I said before, I reread the first chapter of Carol Dweck's book and they had two things in common. One, they were all high achievers fixed mindset and growth mindset. You didn't need a growth mindset to grow. But the second thing they had in common, not a single one of them had read the book. Not a single one of Carol Dweck's iconic examples of fixed or growth mindset had read Carol Dweck's book. They didn't know what fixed mindset was. They didn't know what growth mindset was. They had never once had a lesson that said, this is fixed, this is growth, do that. So my question to you is, if you didn't have the lesson, if you didn't know what a fixed mindset was and a growth mindset was, where did you get your mindset from? And you see, what we've done is you get your mindset, your real mindset, not from a lesson but from your experiences. See, one of the big problems we've had is we've been teaching students about mindsets. We've been telling them what they are, why they're important, why they should have one, and that's all good. But what we need to do is to teach for a growth mindset. One of the questions that often comes up, and I'm just scanning through again, Um, is do I need to teach growth mindsets? Like as a lesson, what are the best lesson plans for growth mindset? And my approach to that is always, "Eh, do you really want to? But do you really want to have a lesson about mindsets? Do you need to? Absolutely not. Does it help? Yeah, yeah, it helps. There's research to show when you talk to kids about their mindset, they're more reflective, more metacognitive, can monitor and do all that sort of stuff. As a growth mindset strategy in your school, do I suggest it? No, because what happens is that many teachers treat mindset as a topic to be taught, information to be covered and understood. And rather than teaching about, sorry, rather than teaching for mindsets, they teach about mindset. See, we have created what, Well, the people in Carol Dweck's book have got what I would call an authentic growth mindset. What have we got in schools most of the time? A learned growth mindset. And so in this growth mindset masterclass, we talk about how to develop that authentic growth mindset, how to fill the environment with these positive growth mindset movers. And To do it, we cover all aspects of this. Yes, we talk about belief. We talk about this key understanding about the backstory. We talk about the five truths about talent that we explore in here. We um, help develop the habits of mind required to achieve that growth. We understand the four different sorts of effort. So it's not just the sort of effort, but it's students are engaging in effective effort. We explode this myth of celebrate mistakes. Can I just say, 
my blogs this week and the next two weeks are all about mistakes. So if you're not on my blog, make sure you do uh, because we need to stop celebrating mistakes. Some of our students are becoming pilots and surgeons and we do not want them making mistakes. So we'll explore six different types of mistakes and all this sort of stuff. We'll talk about how and understand how we exercise our brain in the right way in order to create potential. This idea of potential that I started off with, I love a quote from Anders Ericsson where he says um, that learning isn't a way of reaching your potential. Learning is a way of building your potential. So we'll talk about the type of practice and understand the type of practice we need to engage in to build new potential. And we'll develop agile learners. We'll create your style guide to help make, help make well-intentioned teachers create more growth mindset movers in their classroom. And we'll address the assessment strategies that you can implement in your school that will help develop more growth-orientated messages around that. So we're just on the hour now, and I promised you that the Growth Mindset Masterclass, which is what I'm extending the invitation to you today about, is designed to help you build your classroom with growth mindset movers. It gives you the skills, the strategies, the techniques to, that you'll need to create those mindset movers. But most importantly, it's going to challenge your mindset. It's going to challenge the things that you've assumed, the misunderstandings you've been given about how a gardener's work, for example, that will help you overcome that unconscious bias, those accidental and incidental fixed messages that you create so that you can more automatically and more consistently send positive mindset movers, growth mindset movers in your classroom. So as it ticks over to... Uh, on the half hour, 4.30 here in Melbourne, whatever time it is for you, 7.30 in, the, in Romania and the rest of the places around the world. I'm going to hang around and answer any other questions that come up. But for the rest of you who have to duck off to other meetings and have families and loved ones or peds to go to, uh, thank you for being here today. Um, I will send you an email shortly with links to the ebook and the continuum if you couldn't have downloaded those today and also an invitation to come and join me in the masterclass, two versions or three versions actually. If you can't come to the um, live sessions, there's a self-paced version for 249, no, sorry, 299 Australian dollars, I think. And there is a coached version with me. There is also a whole school version where your whole school can get access to the full course for all teachers for 3000 Australian dollars. So thank you for being here today. I look forward to working with you in the future and I hope I've answered your questions about growth mindset. If you've got others, pop them in the chat box and I'll look at them now. Thanks, folks. What have we got? Thank you, thank you. I've got thank you. Uh, great, thanks for the thanks. Always good to know I've hit a mark. Um, just looking to see other questions that might come up or if I've missed something. If I've missed something because it scrolled past, let me know.